hello everyone good morning and uh, thank you for taking out time on uh, our mon- on sunday morning we today have two extremely distinguished personalities and experts in their fields advocate disha vadekar and uh, professor jadumani uh, uh, mahanand from the jindal global law school assistant professor uh before starting the session i would like to present a brief intro about the uh, about the panelists today we have so advocate disha vadekar is a practice, practicing advocate in the supreme court she identifies herself as an ambedkarite and a womanist she has worked as a legal associate uh, at the chambers of a senior advocate indra jay singh on uh, constitutional matters uh, including the sabri mala case disha vadekar has also uh, headed a legal resource center uh, set up by a project by london school of economics her work involves uh, her work has involved representation in cases of campus discrimination atrocities against scheduled tribes scheduled castes uh, forest right claims and custodial tor- torture she has also worked on the bhima koregaon uh, judicial inquiry commission we hope to have a wonderful insight uh, for uh, from her in our panel today uh, now coming to professor jadumani uh, professor jadumani mahanand is an assistant professor in the jindal global law school and an expert in the political sciences he has obtained his ma and mphil uh, degrees from the political science department of uh, the university of hyderabad he has submitted his uh, phd at center for political studies uh, jnu new delhi uh, professor janumani has published in various peer reviewed journals edited books uh, etc his area of interest lies in contemporary political philosophy on liberal communitarian debates critical theory on recognition uh, and redistribution debate caste recognition democracy and good society Professor Jadumani will put forward his view, views on Ambedkar's ideologies in today's era, uh, among the other things that he will speak on. We welcome both the esteemed panelists uh, for the discussion today. I'll explain the general bre- time breakup. Uh, so each panelist will have like 15 minutes to uh, for their opening general remarks. Then we will move on to the questions designed by the Human Rights Society as a team and uh, addressed individually to the panelists. and finally we'll move on to audience que- que- audiences questions if any so uh, if we have a professor uh, if professor jadumani and uh, 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 advocate disha vadekar with us uh, we would now like to open the floor uh, on the topic of caste privilege in mainstream dissent starting with professor jadumani and then followed up by uh, ma'am disha vadekar uh professor just before you uh, start i just like to tell the audience that this is a, a safe space and there will be no tolerance for any sort of hate speech um the audience m- may make use of the chat box to ask the panelists any questions they might have and uh, we also have volunteers monitoring the chat box so we and we request the audience to please be mindful of their questions or comments that they put up in the chat box thank you okay <clears throat> okay thank you thank you human rights society kartika and uh, trisha and other who have contacted me and finally i agree to speak uh, before some days uh, so there are uh, other group in jgu i don't know them but they also asked me to speak something on caste and patriarchy so but i had no idea about them so i declined that proposal also i was busy in some other work but Uh, but i could see the title the democracy dissent and justice in india it is a really really important topic at this juncture and the way the democracy is been uh, you know controlled and the parliament is you know under the control of the regime and so on you know most of the thing so and discussing this uh, very important topic in this juncture is it's a it's a i mean i would say this is a great uh, challenge that you are taking further so <clears throat> the topic caste uh, privilege in mainstream dissent is uh, it is also a very very timing topic you know uh, speak to us uh, uh, not only in the present time but also when you understand the theoretical understanding of the caste privilege actually it, it can go it can go to past also the it makes sense of our present time all the all the you know all our everyday life kind of thing so whether it is uh, whether it is parliament or whether it is you know democratic institution or the academic space that we all are in so then caste generally caste is relegated to reduced to 
you know dalit victimization and dalits and so on but that is a misnomer that we need to understand that how how and how it has been reduced to only dalit life but it is not the case but i am going to present something today it is actually not about dalit life but it is about something that how we can understand the meaning and philosophy of uh, caste privilege <clears throat> so so what is privilege if i go to you know the very basic idea of it the, and how privilege is constructed and how privilege is understood in indian context so and uh, the answer would be there are different kind of answer different kind of interpretation to this question this uh, very uh, basic question but uh, as far as if uh, i go for on this argument the privilege is actually given and it is constructed idea it is in indian context it is also understood as achieved privileges can can be understood through achievement or achieved but i would argue in this particular presentation privilege is given and constructed so uh, when we say talk about the privilege privilege is also a special rights uh, or advantage available to particular person or the group so in terms of india and caste privilege it is group when you talk about privilege it is actually about the you know advantage available to the privileged group so when we speak about the caste privilege it is associated with the special rights of a group so it is not the individual kind of achievement that you know one person actually privileged to uh, uh, exercise everything or you know take advantage of everything so so in that context caste is not individual or personal kind of thing personal kind of entity caste is a structural therefore caste privilege is something systematic so i would call the caste privilege is something very very brahmanically uh, brahmanical or in 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 the uh, sociological language or social theory language you can call it brahmanical social order so caste privilege is given structural uh, as a system that operates to maintain the system of uh, system of caste in this context the caste in mainstream design uh, uh, we need to understand uh, in the gaze of upper caste privilege it, when we talk about the caste privilege and caste privilege how structurally ingrained then it has to come to come down to understand that what is privilege and who actually get privilege of this so called the caste system or the caste structure so then one need to understand the idea of caste privilege uh, in the gaze of upper caste privilege so in in the structure of caste how how upper caste are privileged in the dissenting in dissenting the order of caste privilege so uh, then when we understand or when you actually deeply think about this uh, the privilege of upper caste the privilege of upper caste actually attach with several kind of you know uh, categories several kind of you know social political uh, category through that we can understand so one could be power then the uh, power position pride purity class and the respect and this all categories actually need further deeper explanation to understand what does caste privilege mean we just cannot understand caste privilege without taking you know account to this all power power position pride purity class respect and many other things so if i you know give a definition of ambedkar dr ambedkar he says one of the very prominent definition he says caste is a is an ascending order of reverence and descending order of hatred and contempt so when we talk about the caste privilege it is actually how caste when you understand caste when you go above it is actually reverence and respect for the upper caste so that is how the privilege is maintained and very interestingly this is you know sanctified through the religion and the religion is the brahmanism so now we actually talk about the hinduism but, but hinduism is very very recent phenomena it is uh, 200 years phenomena when britishers came to india uh, in that time this you know idea of hinduism actually point so i'm not going to talk about that so then caste system as privilege for upper caste further deeply uh, one has to actually look at and understand that how this all that actually i you know set out the privilege position pride purity class respect 
how this also create a capital so when i'm saying capital it is actually a system of cultural capital if i go and further say and you know make sense of it it is something called caste uh, the 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 uh, the uh, it is something called caste cultural caste capital so the the name of upper caste is Uh, the the cultural capital uh, and and it is it, it happens through their birth only so uh, the upper caste actually achieve all these you know qualities uh, qualities again it is a matter of debate qualities may not be right what to actually call it but uh, uh, but uh, uh, when when it comes to under when we understand the 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 concept called cultural caste capital uh, it is by birth by default Uh, upper caste are actually privilege of this all so uh, so so uh, then how the the caste uh, cultural capital uh, produce uh, this all thing power position etc and also control the system uh, 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 system of knowledge system of politics and power and so on and so forth so that is how actually the privilege is maintained Uh, then uh, then i to paper for and that i would actually like to just you know hint about that so i was thinking about uh, i am writing a paper something called caste as disability so uh, so when i am calling caste as disability at the same time i am also calling caste as system of abilities for the upper caste privilege so how it is system of ability just i am reversing chal, you know just just i am um, uh, putting it on the other way and arguing that how caste is also a system of abilities however it is also a system of devil, disabilities i am arguing in a for in a larger paper but i am in also indicating that how the upper caste and the upper caste are actually privileged of getting this all you know by birth so Uh, then it is actually when it comes down to the the concept of the concept of uh, the concept called abilities then it is how uh, how uh, it is been constructed again uh, the 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 idea something called merit the idea of deserve the idea of ability the idea of uh, advantage capable all these are you know by birth upper caste are privileged to occupy and you know preserve this so this is how the the caste as a system of ability produce again again the privilege the idea of privilege so similarly it actually enable them to you know occupy many other things in in our democratic society whether uh, so called democratic society so whether it is a democratic society or a, or it is you know uh, or it is uh, or it or we can say or i can put it in different way saying that we just you know uh, practice democracy in india through institution but in society actually we do not call ourselves as a democratic society but institutional yes we are practicing the democracy so in that sense uh, uh, just i am you know countering this so uh, so when it comes to the idea of ability as far as caste is concerned the 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 system the pri- it 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 produce a system of privilege uh, by birth and and it also capable people so the idea of merit the idea of deserve deserve it is very very constructed idea it is a given idea and by birth someone is actually privileging all all, all of this so this is one point i can actually discuss more on this so the second paper that i am also now working in a book project uh, which is called uh, which is called uh, caste anti caste as way of life again i am just you know putting my own argument here caste is an anti caste is a way of life at the same time i am also uh, you know arguing making a case in order to prove my argument saying that caste is also a way of life you see it is it is it is not only a kind of a theoretical argument it its argument has also historically loaded 
because you see last thousands of years how caste is you know part integral part of uh, indian life whether we can actually go to any other religion as well how uh, islam how muslim in india and how christian and how other religion also practice caste but i am not going into talk about that but i am now only focusing and talking about uh, how uh, the caste is a way of life as far as the hindu life is concerned so hindu life and the caste life is actually going together and maintaining the order so so uh, so when we are talking about you know privilege we need to also take account of all this you know uh, point so then the question is how how caste is been maintained how privilege is been maintained so for i would like to give an example to understand this so for take an example of a poor upper caste or a brahmin person i could say male or female so i'm saying br a brahmin person feel all the time superior and respectful to dalit or the lower, or lower caste in a caste dominated society so uh, it is this example is cited by many many people you take example of the the highest you know respected person the the, the person who actually had highest uh, you know the highest post in india which is you know uh, the president of india so president of india also sometime you know less less than the the person coming from a brahmin family or upper caste family so there was a case uh, Uh, happened in in the puri jagannath temple our present president he was not even allowed to you know enter to the temple so then you now understand that how the caste privilege even if a brahmin person uh, is is you know on un, not on educated but a, a priest he is supposed to be the highly educated person a, a, a person who has you know uh, knowledge of all you know uh, religion and so on so this person actually highest uh, respect than a person who is actually head of the state so this is how the privilege is been maintained this is how we need to understand the what privilege means so according to uh, according to some some uh, psychologists they they study this uh, 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 according to lorley uh, lorley he writes here Uh, you like to have nice thing but you do not want to think you got those thing as a result of unlearned advantage the privilege understand their achievement is individual act but not admitting that privilege is a systematic and upholding uh, the the inheritance of caste privilege so uh, the 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 last part of this quote actually i uh, added into this uh, the author actually wants to say here that you like to have nice thing but you do not want to think you got those thing as a result of unlearned advantage so uh, how how this you know it, it happens in india uh, when we understand the caste privilege and the how caste privilege is maintained uh, because uh, it is also in in heri Uh, inherit inheritance of caste privilege and it is very systematic as i am arguing so uh, so therefore the question is to now you know pose and raise that acknowledging privilege is is meaningless uh, if 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 it doesn't actually entail to give up the privilege this is a big big question to actually you know put forward to everybody uh, that how how one acknowledge the privilege and how actually one uh giving giving of the privilege is it so is it so the case in in the last you know 100 years of indian uh, indian discourse on caste so uh, the martin luther king says somewhere very very interestingly uh, he says i am quoting here lament lamentably it is a historical fact that privileged groups seldom give up their privilege voluntarily so so uh, it is also happen in 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 african american context and and those who actually would like to study they can study uh, uh, malcolm max they can study uh, there is a book by james baldwin i am not your negro all these things are there and there are also conversation on this uh, <clears throat> so uh, uh, 
So now uh, I would like to also raise a question uh, in, in our contemporary time. Uh, uh, in the mainstream upper caste discourse against caste, uh, there is also, you know, they are uh, kind of in, in the ambiguous status saying that uh, I would actually call it funny, funny. Because upper caste, they, they, they themselves actually defend and claim in various places saying that all upper caste are not casteist. That statement itself is a casteist remark. They are actually upholding the caste. For example, take example of surname in India. So it is someone has to actually study the surname. How a surname actually privilege your, your position? So the moment you say, you know, uh, the moment you say, uh, the Kumar in in uh, Chamar in in in, uh, in in Uttar Pradesh, there are various surnames. Just I'm telling the caste name, but the, uh, you take any surname, for example, Dahiwal is a surname in Maharashtra, or or Nag is a surname in in Odisha, or you know, or likewise, you, you take any surname by a name itself, actually, you know, make someone down and someone up so for example take surname of you know rao uh, surname of uh, uh, misra and many other so the surname itself actually an indicator of you know privilege and disprivilege so so the the question that i was trying to raise here that when upper caste are actually calling themselves as not casteist so and in fact none of the upper caste uh, would actually admit that they are casteist. If they admit that they are casteist, that would be actually so. Uh, I mean, people are uh, people are uh, also you know admitting that they practice caste, they they uphold caste, and so on. There was a documentary uh, made by Stalin, which is called Untouch India. So there is a Brahmin priest from Banaras. He is directly saying that uh, so I practice caste. I am a Sanatani Brahmin, and so on. So. Uh, people like you know this uh, uh, the priest the brahmin priest or the the upper caste priest they can say it but in in the democratic spaces like universities or you know democratic institution it is if someone is calling that i practice caste uh, that could be a different remark but uh, but it is not to i'm not you know you know saying that they are not they do not practice caste so the statement, therefore, I always, uh, I actually reflect and think uh, over this again and again, uh, that calling oneself is, uh, and is uh, um, calling oneself is upper caste and not practicing caste, that is, uh, that is a flawed argument, that is as itself is a caste remark. So one example, the best example of last 100, 200 years is Gandhi as a figure. So when we understand Gandhi's, you know, uh, take on caste or Gandhi's argument on caste. So Gandhi is a person who actually would say, I, I, I would like to, you know, abolish untouchability, but at the same time, I, I, at the same time, I would like to also, you know, uphold the caste and caste has is many, you know, uh, privileges and it also a system, ideal system that, uh, you know, produce many good things. So I'm not going into that. But that is an example to understand that uh, uh, the, in the caste system, untouchability is, is actually very, very bad. It is worse, but the system of caste is good. So that, uh, that actually interpretation expelled that way. So very interestingly, very interestingly, Ambedkar in, uh, in his reply to Gandhi in Annihilation of Caste, uh, he, he says this, and I would like to quote here, uh, the best for the best of men cannot be moral if the basis of relationship between them and their followers is fundamentally a wrong relationship. To a slave, his master may be better or worse, but there cannot be a good master. A good a good man cannot be a master, and a master cannot be a good man. You see, such a very very you know. Uh, theoretical argument he actually making us and that's that actually make to understand this uh, this you know upper caste gaze when they are saying that uh, uh, all upper caste are not casteist so how are you going to actually make sense of this 
so now i am coming to my you know last part of this presentation i don't know how much time i have uh, so i would like to refer one very very important article uh, written by gopal guru which is called the how egalitarian social how egalitarian indian social sciences it is it, it published in epw in 2002 uh, also they have come with a book uh, which is called uh, indian experience theory so those who would like to read please read this article and he make very very uh, he makes very very you know uh, powerful argument uh, where he says that theoretical brahmin and empirical sudra so i'm not going to actually talk about that but where he also says which is i am interested to explore that uh, how the knowledge is actually controlled by the twice born people twice born caste so recently i have published this paper something called ambedkar in an academic space i had actually circulated to email to uh, kartika to actually circulate this paper so those who would like to understand this argument uh, would make sense of uh, the the how knowledge is been controlled and how ambedkar as a person who actually talks about very very important categorical caste and uh, he actually challenge or you know give an another egalitarian revolutionary interpretation of indian society philosophy religion and so on he has been actually not taught in indian university and college for for several several years so that's why i'm arguing somewhere in this paper that how ambedkar is you know uh, not taught in the university so when i am saying that why ambedkar is not taught in university that actually give a very very Uh, it is not a simple way to understand because uh, the categories that ambedkar gave and he has written that actually make us to understand the 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 the, the topic that we are discussing today is something called the caste privilege which is not actually available in other kind of writing and the ambedkar the way actually he has given this framework that make us to actually think and interpret several many other things so that uh, i would really re uh, like to request you to read this article if you have time then uh, you can see that how uh, the the caste privilege actually occupy so something that like that i would like to you know uh, point here that uh, where don't we call uh, uh, you as a student of law you must be knowing this better than me which is called intellectual property rights right so where don't we call knowledge is an intellectual property rights of the brahmin in particular and the upper caste in general because if you understand the the system of knowledge for last you know many many thousands year and how knowledge is been controlled and how knowledge is also you know uh, you know percolate down to many other field of our life right whether it is you know our cultural life whether it is social life whatever we do it is you know through this you know the system of knowledge i have in fact written a uh, my uh, my first chapter of uh, phd thesis actually talks about ambedkar philosophy of knowledge where actually i am dealing with this concept called how knowledge is been you know produce reproduce also you know control so uh, so the question that is been you know raised here and the, the 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 title of this you know uh, this panel is a uh, uh, caste privilege in the mainstream descent i am just giving you know this very narrow kind of uh, you know uh, uh, narratives at least we can get a framework to understand this so uh, when i am calling it uh, intellectual property rights so how intellectual in, intellectual or the knowledge is a property for the certain section of society the the so called the uh, upper caste society and how it has been uh, occupied and how it has been controlled and you know maintained or well, one need to understand the student of law would be must be interested to actually dig out this history that it is not just you know intellectual property right in a, in a in a minimal sense of law that we are reading but one need to actually explore the theoretical understanding of this so called the intellectual property right uh, who are the intellectuals or who are the people the who seek for knowledge and how knowledge actually you know not given to a section of society if you understand the system of caste then you understand it better so so uh, then uh, then uh, 
if i give an very very you know recent example of uh, to understand this you know the privilege i'm not giving an example from india but i would like to give an example from usa so recently there is a book by michael sandel where he the book title is uh, the tyranny of merits uh, what's become the common goal question mark so if you read this book you would know that how privilege is been maintained privilege is maintained through your the class he actually the very system of education that is in usa is fraud it is completely fraud because education is actually it is brought it is actually purchased so those who have money those who are privileged they can actually buy education so he call it is very very fraud system so i am not going to you know talk about the the private universities in india but i would like to actually uh, give you a kind of you know uh, uh, a hints or a framework of indian university or the indian educational system already theoretical in a theoretical sense i have actually talked about it if you go to an empirical kind of understanding and you know dig out all this you can know that how the system of knowledge is controlled by this the the so called the privileged caste so you take any university randomly i am not calling iit iit is actually balatant so you go to any university whether state university even colleges uh, or you know uh, or take bureaucracy or judiciary you as a student of law you should uh, actually uh, know this and actually research on this what kind of you know representation the system actually uphold and who are the people actually you know in the position to you know control it so i am not you know going into many other things so i would i should stop it stop here now and you know uh, would be listening to disa so so thank you so much for uh, inviting me to this very important uh, uh, you know theme and i would be very interesting to you know interact with you and take up any question if there are so thank you so much uh thank you professor that was a great insight towards how privilege and caste work in the current mainstream descent and uh, the ambedkar ideologies you reflected were really thought provoking and as law students we definitely have come across the ideas that you presented uh now we'll move on to uh, advocate disha wadekar for her opening remarks and then we'll uh, of course come back to professor jadumani with the, the questions that we have designed for him uh so ma'am yeah uh thanks thanks uh, shubham for that uh, introduction thanks uh, human rights uh, society at jindal for inviting me uh i'm really privileged to be sharing this uh, uh, platform with jadumani uh we go uh, way back with friends uh, and i've seen his work uh, in jnu babsa and uh, we've been interacting on a lot of uh, uh, issues uh, that surround us um but uh, uh, most importantly uh, you know the human rights society and i had uh, uh, when i received the invitation i had congratulated you uh, for just selecting this topic you know or even thinking about this topic because um you know the the discourse on mainstream dissent is uh, you know we are all discussing about it we're talking about it um but uh, nobody is really talking about the caste privilege that surrounds that discourse uh, nobody is talking about who is creating uh that discourse uh, nobody is talking about who are the gatekeepers of uh, dissent right um uh, who decide what is dissent and what isn't dissent uh, who decide what is valid dissent and what is it right um so so i think this uh, discussion is uh, really relevant and important in uh that context and because we are talking about dissent i would also uh, start by which i usually do with my own dissent um uh so uh, in a way i was looking at uh, the panelists and this is what i usually do um and uh, uh, this this event that you have organized on dissent i would um though i would congratulate you but i would there is also a sort of criticism and i hope you take it in uh, the right way uh, is uh, uh, that when it comes to the topic of caste uh, usually you will have people from bahujan backgrounds who are invited for such topics uh but i would really like to hear rather than a jadu or a dishawadekar talk about caste privilege you know uh someone from the upper caste community talk about how they enjoy caste privilege i think because that discourse 
um, is more important, right? Uh, we would really like to be an audience to how people enjoy caste privilege, right? Uh, and talk about it. Uh, but most importantly, uh, how um, people from the so-called upper caste, Savannah backgrounds, uh, can become uh, universalistic, right? They can talk about the general descent. Uh, they can talk about uh, patriarchy and descent. They can talk about the topics that are in vogue. Um, but uh, when it comes to the topics in caste, it's only people from a certain background who are invited. So I think I'd like to start by dissenting to that, right? Um, uh, moving ahead, um, uh, you know, Jadu, Jadu Mani has uh, given us a, really laid out the foundation of what caste privilege is. And uh, I think for today's, uh, woke, uh, uh, you know, this, this, this entire woke progressive um, discourse that is there, uh, you see privilege is a word that we use regularly, you know, uh, I have this kind of privilege, and I have that kind of privilege, and you have some uh, intellectually honest people who admit to uh, that privilege even, but I think Jadu Mani has uh, really put that in perspective, and he says that the word privilege, uh, you know, is soaked in entitlement in India. Right, it is soaked in the blubber of entitlement. Right, uh, so uh, th there are so many issues where people have not even worked. Right, uh, but just because merely coming from an upper caste, you can just you were so entitled, you might be feel so entitled that you can speak on certain topics. Right, um, that is caste privilege. It's it's beyond privilege. It's entitlement. Uh, and I think that uh, you know when we say privilege, privilege has a certain notion of individuality. Right, uh, but we need to move from individual uh, privilege to something that is systemic, which is caste, right, and how it entitles us. So I think Jadumani really laid that foundation well for us, um, and uh, I would like to build upon that. As a lawyer, I'm not an anthropologist or a, a sociologist, uh, really. So I'll be speaking about uh, what I have seen in my cases um, while handling legal cases. Uh, but before that, I would like to. Uh, you know, start with mainstream dissent and why we are even discussing mainstream dissent today or why we are even discussing dissent today, right? Uh, we see that in today's context, uh, in today's regime-based uh, dissent, right, I would call it that, um, uh, we are seeing that a lot of upper caste people are going behind bars, right? Uh, uh, they are being attacked uh, for their um, ideologies, uh, their views, their opinions, right? Uh, and that shakes our conscience. So Disha Ravi, uh, a 21 year old um, environmentalist uh, from uh, Bangalore, um, when she goes behind the bars, it's something that really shakes up our conscience. Um, and then we feel the need to talk about it because then it is important. So um, I think the, the, the discussion, when we start the discussion in itself, uh, you know, uh, it starts uh, because uh, we cannot uh, fathom with the fact that we cannot accept the fact that upper castes uh, from privileged backgrounds uh, should be or can be behind bars, right? Uh, on the contrary, you see that uh, you have 70, 75% uh, people from marginalized identities who are languishing in jails, right? Uh, and the NCRB data is very clear on that, right? Uh, and the marginalized identities have been targeted or are being targeted uh, uh, for ages. Uh, but that is something that, that doesn't become a mainstream topic or a mainstream discourse. Right? So for starters, when we define dissent, when we define or when we, when we decide to have a discourse on dissent is also defined by the Savarnas, by the upper castes, right? Um, uh, moving on, I think, uh, you know, what, when we, when we are talking about dissent and mainstream dissent, I think uh, we really derive that idea of mainstream dissent from, to me, we, we derive it from the independence movement, right? Uh, when you saw a lot of a wide ranging uh, a wide array or spectrum of upper caste activists, intellectuals, etc., who were dissenting the British regime, right? Um, and uh, we, we saw that they ranged from conservatives to liberals, right? From the Veer Savar Savarkars to the Gandhi, right? Um, and and that is when uh, uh, you know really uh, you know dissent came to be discussed. Um, but let me tell you that we have a history which is far far. Uh, deeper and far older, right? And uh, let me deconstruct mainstream dissent uh, for you. Um, you know, Ambedkar uh, in his writings has very eloquently put out that, uh, uh, you know, why are the Shudra Shudras, 
right? Uh, there were communities that repudiated the authority of the Vedas. And they were relegated to the position of the Shudras, the Dalits, the untouchables, right? Um, and uh, if one is to really think of dissent from a very fundamental basic um, uh, positioning, I think uh, we'll have to say that it is uh, the Shudras, uh, it is, the, uh, it, it is the, the communities that were rejected by the Manaswati. Uh, it is the communities that repudiated uh, the infallibility of the scriptures that governed the, the, the law of this land, you know. Uh, it is those communities that are the original dissenting communities, right? Um, and they have faced marginalization, criminalization on account of that dissent. Uh, so, so I think let, let us completely deconstruct this uh, very modern um, Savanna notion of dissent, uh, which says that uh, you have to be from a certain caste, uh, or you have to have a certain capital to be a dissenter. Uh, you have to have a certain privilege uh, which is to say that you need to belong to an intellectual class or uh, you need to be an activist um, or, or you need to have a certain social capital to be a dissenter. And let's just say that, you know, let's trace the history of the dissenters in this land. And to me, the first original dissenter of this land is the Buddha, right? Um, and uh, and uh, from there, we have seen uh, the history of marginalization of the dissenting communities. Uh, I would take this occasion also to talk about another community or, or another set of communities, um, uh, the denotified tribes, uh, who were basically known as the criminal tribes, who were criminalized for their acts of dissent, which is uh, that they were forest communities, they were nomadic communities, uh, and uh, you had uh, the Brahmin Vanyas enter their forest, intrude in their forest, grab their lands, um, and then you also had the British colonizers who were doing that, uh, who were following suit. And these communities came together and dissented this kind of intrusion, right? Uh, and they were criminalized on that account by way of a law called the Criminal Tribes Act of 1871. I would urge you people, because we are law students, to really read about the Criminal Tribes Act 1871, which uh, criminalized the denotified tribes, and it also criminalized the transgender community, right? Um, and, uh, you know, the, the resistance of these communities, the quelling of this resistance happened through this piece of legislation that criminalized them. And we see in, in the aftermath of uh, that, the Criminal Tribes Act, uh, though it was repealed um, in 1952, uh, these communities were denotified, but you still see a lot of policing happening. Uh, you still see the community go through custodial torture, custodial rape, you see uh, that they are criminalized. You see that in, in each denotified family will have 40 to 50 criminal cases slapped in them and the harassment of these communities continues through a crim by way of criminal law, right? Um, so, so I would also say that the denotified tribes of this land have been uh, those communities and those dissenting communities. I would also go on to say that the transgender community, which did not subscribe to a certain Brahminical notion of, uh, 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 you know, what is pure uh, sexuality or what is what is a pure gender. Um, I think those communities have also been criminalized, right? And we see that, uh, especially if you read the Nalsa judgment uh, of the Supreme Court, you will see that it goes in, in, in the details of uh, the Criminal Tribes Act and the criminalization of the transgender community. Right. Um, going beyond that, I would say that, um, uh, you know, uh, in some of the recent cases, we saw that a judgment by the Supreme Court came in 2018 called the Subhash Mahajan judgment, right? Uh, popularly, unpopularly known as the Misuse of uh, Atrocities Act judgment, right? Uh, and what this judgment did uh, in 2018, uh, it was a judgment by Justice Goel and Justice Hugo uh, and it uh, in effect, it diluted the Atrocities Act. Uh, and there were countrywide protests. You know, lakhs of people were on the streets. I don't even know if uh, some of you have heard uh, about those protests. Uh, 10 lives were lost, 10 Dalit lives were lost in those protests, right? Um, and they were dissenting something. They were dissenting um, a judgment that basically made them even more vulnerable in a caste ridden society, right? Um, and nobody talked about that dissent. Uh, I would also like to talk about the Bhima Koregao case. I think I, while working uh, on the Bhima Koregao case and uh, representing before the Judicial Commission, we came across a very strange phenomena, and I'd like to discuss that. 
Uh, in 2018, again, uh, Bhima Koregao, the one-sided violent attack uh, on Dalits in this place called Bhima Koregao happened, where they were actually going to pay their homage uh, to the martyrs uh, at Bhima Koregao uh, who fought the, for the valiant battle there. And uh, it was 200 years. Um, and uh, on the 200th year, they were attacked by upper castes. Um, and uh, following the, that, that attack, there were a lot of Dalit, there was a lot of Dalit youth uh, that came on the streets protesting that violent attack. And uh, let me try, tell you that uh, it was not one or two, but there were 655 FIRs that were lodged against Dalit youth across Maharashtra. These each of these 655 FIRs would have 100 to 200 unnamed Dalit youth, right? So uh, a standard FIR would go like this. Um, a, a, B, C uh, were seen protesting. Uh, the charges uh, in, in those FIRs would be 353, section 353, um, and uh, which is again, uh, a non bailable and a cognizable offense. Um, so, which meant that uh, you were rendered even more vulnerable and each affair would have some 100, 200 Dalit youth who were unnamed. So what the, in effect, the police could do is the police could say, go to a Ramabai Nagar and Ambedkar Nagar, a Bhim Nagar, and just start combing operations because the, the Dalit youth were unnamed. So what this did was that it, it basically criminalized an entire community, right? It, it basically criminalized the almost the entire Dalit community in Maharashtra. And um, each FI would have 100, 200 names, which meant that uh, there were some 10 to 15,000 Dalit youth who were facing the potential threat of criminalization, right? Who could be behind bars at any point. Combing operations could be started. It became a surveillance mechanism. Police started going in these bastis and harassing this, these youth. Um, and uh, what, what happened was, uh, a year later, so the police did not conduct any action then, just lodged these 655 FIRs. And a year later, just two months before the General Assembly elections, combing operations started, police started going to all these bastis. Uh, uh, you know, exterminment notices were served um, uh, in Maharashtra. Uh, then uh, you also had, uh, you know, summons that were being served. Uh, and, uh, you know, bail surety of 50,000 and 80,000 was being demanded, right? For imagine Dalit youth in Bastis, uh, in slums, you know, and that was the, the, the amount of surety that was demanded, which meant that you are just going to stay in jail, right? Uh, so so uh, what I'm trying to uh, point out through, through these examples uh, is that uh, dissent has, in, in the mainstream sense has meant that it is individual, it is savarna, it is defined by the upper castes, it is validated by the upper castes, but the original dissenting communities um, have been completely erased uh, from this discourse on in, in mainstream dissent, right? Uh, you also see that uh, back in 2016, I think, if I'm not wrong, uh, that uh, a place in Odisha called Niyamgiri, Right? And you had this corporation called Vedanta uh, that was uh, basically going to just uh, wash out the entire tribal culture, the tribal people from their own land. Uh, uh, the, the, the corporate uh, started the land grab and then you had the Dongria Kond tribes who were opposing it, who were resisting it, uh, and they formed a samiti. Right, um, and they have been resisting uh, the intrusion uh, of Vedanta in Niyamgiri, and nobody is talking about it. Right, uh, they have been termed as uh, what is now popularly known as surrendered Maoists. So I think this is something that we need to know as lawyers that this is this is a new, you know, uh, in the in the long line of anti-nationals and Naxalites, there is also now surrendered Maoists, and nobody is talking about that. Mostly, uh, you have the tribal communities that are being targeted, right? Uh, uh, and uh, they are so the minute they uh, start opposing and resisting the state, um, uh, you will see that uh, they are being picked up, they are being tortured. And they are being forced to say that they are surrendered Maoists, and then they are paraded before the media, right? And this has been happening. 
uh, the recent case of Kumi Sikaka, I don't know if you guys have heard, but definitely do read about it. You know, as we read about Disharavi, we also need to know what is happening to this 21 year old Dongria Kond tribal girl, right? Uh, she was opposing Vedanta's intrusion. She was opposing uh, mining uh, in Niamgiri. And uh, she was picked up uh, and she's been languishing in jail uh, for uh, two, three years now. Right. Uh, and she doesn't have legal representation. There is no noise created around her resistance, her dissent. Um, uh, there is there is no, uh, you know, senior counsel, senior advocate uh, who is pro bono representing her in courts. Uh, right. Uh, or we don't even know if she has any legal representation for that matter. Um, and uh, we don't know if uh, she's been tortured in police custody or no. We saw that in Nadeep Kaur's case, right? Uh, that how uh, custodial torture is becomes, uh, uh, you know, a norm in literally in every, almost every Dalit Bahujan Adivasi woman who is uh, arrested, right? Um, and you, I, I would like to tell you the story of Indar Malbai. Uh, which is really, really a, a, a ghastly story. Indar Malbai came from a Pardi denotified community in MP. And uh, Indar Malbai uh, was opposing the police because the police uh, usually target denotified tribal communities. Uh, any kind of case, any kind of criminal case that happens in their area, they know that how do we show that we, we have a hold on crime? pick up parties, pick up people from denotified communities, because that's the easiest thing to do. There is nobody who's going to raise a voice. And uh, Indar Malbai was uh, being harassed. And also that also becomes a tool for harassment. So the police um, extract money uh, from these communities saying that, you know, you we will put you in jail. Uh, we will put you behind the bars. Uh, you do that. Otherwise, we will uh, otherwise just uh, pay us, uh, you know, the bribe. And she was being harassed for years together uh, because of that. And uh, once uh, I think she, she went to the police station and she said that not anymore, I am not going to pay any bribe um, and do what you have to, right? And she threatened suicide. She said that I will commit, if you, if you continue to harass me like this, I will, uh, you know, uh, set myself ablaze in front of you in the police station. And it is said that that case is still underway, but uh, it is said that the police in the station actually offered um, a matchstick and a, a matchbox to her and said that, do it, do it in front of us. And uh, she uh, went ahead and she set herself ablaze, right? And which, which is basically police murder and which is institutional murder. Uh, but, uh, you know, that kind of a case happens. We do not know who is taking up that case. We do not know what is happening, but this kind of police torture and custodial torture is very much evident in the lives of, um, Dalit Bahujan community, starting from the case of Mathura. Mathura, a tribal girl, goes to the police station. You know, we you all must have read about the Tukaram case, Tukaram versus state of Maharashtra, right? Um, and she goes to the police. Her plea is that she needs protection. And she goes for protection to the police. And she is raped inside the precincts of a police station by the policemen, right? Uh, so, so these are the communities that dissent, that resist in the face of direct uh, oppression. These are the communities that are facing direct oppression and we are resisting it. Uh, but you see that they are rendered the most vulnerable, right? Um, they do not have the resources. They do not have the understanding of the criminal justice system. They do not have the access that Savarna communities have to the criminal justice system. So to me, their dissent is really a very difficult dissent and they have been dissenting. They still, they are still dissenting. Uh, also in, in, in the face of, uh, you know, this, this atmosphere of them not enjoying any kind of media attention, right? Adisha Ravi's case garners so much attention. Um, and we, we are all for civil liberties. We all, I mean, that, that thought of a 21-year-old behind bars should shake our conscience. But the thought of a 21-year-old, 18-year-old Kumi Sikaka should also shake our conscience. Anodip Kaur should also shake our conscience. Uh, and Indar Malbai should also shake our conscience, right? The thought of 10,000, 15,000 Dalit youth being criminalized should shake our conscience, right? Um, and that is not happening. Um, so uh, I think uh, I, I would like to, these would probably be my starting remarks and I would like to take some questions after this. Yeah. 
Um, thank you so much, ma'am, for uh, you know tracing the history of dissent and highlighting uh, some very important aspects of marginalized communities and dissent and their interlinkage, and also on uh, educating us on um, so many issues that we were unaware of so far. Uh, now I'd like to ask um, Professor Jadumani a question, and you can, uh, if you have anything else to add, you can uh, jump in. So, uh, Professor, my question is, so there recently has been a rising trend amongst um, leaders belonging to the ruling party wherein uh, Baba Sahib's name is dropped in political campaigns as a hero for Hindus. So this is um, with an aim to secure Dalit votes. So as an Ambedkarite scholar, what is your opinion on this um, strategy of appropriation to kind of neutralize the threat that his legacy places. And uh, one more thing that happened in, in contradiction to this, um, in universities, students who, who student activists are um, fighting for Ambedkar right, uh, um, rights have also been criminalized in jail. So what do you, why do you think this contradiction has arised? And uh, yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Hima, uh, for this uh, very pertinent question that this question actually address our contemporary times, contemporary society, the politics that we all are going through. So, <clears throat> yes, the, the question of appropriation, uh, I would actually begin by citing one book, uh, which is also a lawyer. He, he edited this book. He's from uh, Andhra Pradesh. Uh, uh, he, I, I forget his name, but he recently passed away. Uh, he was the first uh, Dalit lawyer. Uh, he, fought, he fought these cases, uh, cases on atrocity in uh, uh, Andhra Pradesh High Court. Uh, I, I'll tell his name if I remember. But they have come and wrote a book, edited book, something called Ambedkar cannot be appropriated either by left or the right. So this is very, very provocative title. But at a, in a political level, in, in our ground politics, in empirical, empirical, uh, when you come to very, very, you know, uh, at the empirical side of it. Uh, so if Ambedkar ideas are not been appropriated, it, it cannot be appropriated, I would actually endorse this, state, this you know, title. But uh, I would also like to problematize this fact that uh, the, the Ambedkar as a symbol, as an identity, uh, in, a, in a narrow sense, not in a meaningful substantive sense, it is not, uh, it has been actually appropriated. For example, if you, if you take this regime, this regime, they have actually created a pilgrimage. So five pilgrimage to understand this, how Ambedkar, um, Ambedkar as an icon, as a symbolic figure has been, you know, uh, captured and, and in, in return, they also getting the vote. So, uh, which is the five pilgrimage? Uh, one is this, you know, uh, in in uh, in Maharashtra, uh, the the place called uh, uh, Chaitya Bhumi in Mumbai, where he was cremated. Uh, uh, then, uh, then Diksha Bhumi too. Then uh, one is in London, and uh, uh, where he was studying, where he was actually his residence was there. Uh, and uh, his birthplace Mao, uh, Maho in Madhya Pradesh, now it is situated. And also they have this, you know, Ambedkar Research Foundation, Ambedkar International Research Foundation in Delhi. So uh, uh, this is first regime, this happened in the first regime of BJP. So they have created this pilgrimage in order to actually, you know, uh, at least capture the imagination of Dalits in India and, you know, uh, get some vote. So this is one way to actually interpret. Uh, also, uh, uh, also uh, uh, one need to understand when we are uh, uh, understanding the question of appropriation. Actually, it goes back to 1930s when Ambedkar proposed this idea called uh, the idea of uh, representation when there was a debate between Gandhi and Ambedkar. And Gam uh, Ambedkar was so adamant of you know upholding the idea of separate electorate and while where he was actually upholding this idea because he wanted to have an authentic representative uh, by who is actually uh, a person who is representing 
in the assembly or the parliament truly represent he was actually searching for a mechanism searching for a method by which uh, uh, the dalit community themselves they actually send an authentic moral a true representative at that time the debate actually created so there was a fraction called hindu mahasabha they actually try to appropriate some dalit so there is a person called munge uh, from north uh, from south india he was then part of uh, no 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 he, he is from maharashtra he was part of the uh, hindu mahasabha and at the same time there are also congress and uh, uh, within the congress there are also you know other dalits they were also you know appropriated in the congress uh, in order to actually not uh, concretize or not take into consideration of ambedkar idea of separate electorate so when you understand the the historical background of the app appropriation the politics of appropriation one needs to actually go back to history and trace it to the present then post independence india you see how it has happened uh, it it was so you know uh, uh, it is so you know strange uh, to you know make this point uh, when ambedkar Uh, was you know nominated he nominated in in uh, in two in one constituency called bhandara in maharashtra and also in other places he lost the election in 1952 so you see the ambedkar like a figure statue you know a a, a icono uh, a, 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 a an iconoclast i would say and also a statue of statement he he lost the election so uh, and in place of that the other you know how uh, the election took place and how he was actually pushed into the corner and the 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 fraction created within the community and there are also other incident and if you just you know understand this in 1937 election and how this uh, you know how ambedkar successfully won a uh, considerable number of seats so it become a threat for the actually i would not say only gandhi but i would say actually the the upper caste political parties to actually take it further of this idea called uh, separate uh, electorate so then post independence india up to 1980s it was it was you know uh, by uh, congress you see there are considerable number of you know mla and mps from congress party who who were you know Uh, belonging to the dalit community so how does it actually take place one need to understand not just simply you know uh, take this example of the present regime so because uh, at earlier it was by the congress and how congress was able to actually capture all this you know representative through because there was no separate electorate method so what ambedkar was actually asking for point 1 and the presently presently it is by the it is by the bjp so it is not a surprise for dalit who are actually fighting for dalit who are actually fighting against caste so it is not a big surprise for them to see how dalits are part of bjp it could be it is you know this is the obvious you know a, a trend actually taking place so the question the second question related to this uh, of course i would say i in fact i was thinking i am thinking to write a commentary something called Uh, regime against intellectual so uh, so of course the Ro rohit demula is, is is a best example to understand that how it you know intellectual capacity to you know challenge uh, uh, the vice chancellor of uh, vice chancellor of university of hyderabad and at the end he has to actually you know come into end so uh, so and the present time you, you can see that how many even dalit this i was rightly pointing out that how many protester so now now the protester uh, in the regime are you know anti national the protester who are actually asking for democracy who are actually asking for you know uh, who are critiquing the limitation of the government they are termed as an anti national so it cannot be only dalit other of course other uh, upper people other people are also part of it but in case of dalit uh, also there are many many people who are also in the jail there are many journalists and recently what happened in this farmer protest you know this all so the point is this this is this is uh, one need to also make a distinction of this uh, earlier regime and the present regime also the congress that how and 
putting this all marginalized community into the center and understand their relationship and their appropriation so that we can make sense of uh, the 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 contemporary politics from you know uh, ambedkar point of point of view this i may add something if he if he likes to add thank you i would uh, i i just wanted to add in fact uh, and i think i missed it out uh, from from my uh, previous talk i think um you know ambedkar dr ambedkar was uh, called an anti national right and he was he was being called an anti national by the same nationalists that are very well known to us right um, and and really that that nuance is is important i feel uh, because uh, dr ambedkar was uh dissenting not just uh the british colonial regime which was a uh, uh, in a way a, a superficial uh, uh, uh you know um uh regime uh, in in that sense uh that was controlling uh but he was he was dissenting a system uh right and my question is that why isn't annihilation of caste uh the center or and the be all and end all of all our discussion on dissent and the reason is this because if caste is so systemic if caste governs the, the economy you know uh, uh jadumani was saying that the economy of caste really is the foundation that defines all relationships um it defines how patriarchy functions right within within the indian context you cannot understand patriarchy if you do not understand caste it is at the very foundation patriarchy in india is brahmanical patriarchy right um so 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 understanding all kinds of power relationships the the basis of it is caste and my question to all savarna dissenters is this that why isn't annihilation of caste uh really uh, at the base of our discussion and discourse on dissent you know we can conveniently uh dissent a regime right but are we questioning uh the very basis of this regime you know why do we see a, a fascist regime is in place that fascist regime or those fascist people in power the brahmin baniya oligarchy as i call it you know uh it's it's literally the the, the state is a brahmin baniya state right um and and when we are dissenting certain people in certain regimes are we asking ourselves that irrespective of these people you know jadumani rightly pointed out that even before this regime do you think that the previous regimes were any less fascist for a dalit and adivasi a denotified tribal right they have always been this land has always been a fascist land for them right the oppressed in uh, this country the marginalized identities in this in this country and therefore to just conveniently oppose a, a regime uh, because it has a, a certain degree of uh, uh, you know it can to a certain extent uh, draw from your power as a savarna right to conveniently dissent it and to not question the structures the systems that oppress uh, is is to me what mainstream dissent really is you know in definition uh and i would really like to go back and say that you know uh in uh the the entire freedom struggle even a veer savarkar is a dissenter right a mangal pandey is also a dissenter right a mangal pandey who was upholding uh the conservative ideals right the the conservative hindu ideals of purity and pollution that oppressed millions in this country uh that person also becomes a dissenter so so the question really is that what do we define as dissent and uh, is our dissent convenient is our dissent that serves only uh, uh you know those who are in power for them to garner more power and to uh, you know increase their power and uh, i would really like to read an excerpt from uh, what dr ambedkar had said when he was being attacked as an anti national and i think that really would fit uh, in today's context he says that who is a peculiar nationalist and he was criticizing those nationalists the so called nationalists uh, who were calling him anti nation in today's context and for today's talk i would just like to replace that word peculiar nationalist with peculiar savarna dissenter right uh, so dr ambedkar says that a peculiar patriot and a nationalist in india is one who sees with open eyes his fellow men being treated as being less than men uh but his humanity does not arise in protest 
He knows that men and women for no cause are denied their human rights, but it does not prick his civic sense to helpful action. He finds whole classes of people shut out from public employment, but it does not rouse his sense of justice and fair play. Hundreds of evil practices that injure man and society are perceived by him, but they do not sicken him with disgust. The Patriots' one cry is power and more power for him and for his class. Uh, I am glad I do not belong to that class of Patriots. This is him in a way talking about the Mangal Pandey section class of dissenters, right? Um, and uh, I, I think uh, it, it is important that we distinguish uh, between that because we are seeing in today's social media age, you know, the so-called dissenters, the so-called liberals, um, on the one hand are dissenting the regime, right? But on the other hand would, uh, you know, upload pictures of them uh, celebrating Karva Chauth and would say that we are just celebrating uh, it because because it's a uh, it's uh, you know it's uh, it's an event and we we all enjoy uh, but there's there's no logic to it but we do not understand that these same practices these same rituals these same festivals are a reason for the oppression of millions in this country the Bahujans the majority in this country right uh, and and that to me is the is the Savarna brand of dissent is the is the Savarna brand of mainstream dissent you can easily go on to uh, play a lead character of a revolutionary rebellious uh, Bahujan chief minister in this country, right? And you can do it with so much impunity. Uh, and uh, when when there is criticism that comes your way, you know, we saw it in, in the recent case of Richa Chadha's, right? Uh, that uh, before that, Richa Chadha was a dissenting uh, woman. She was uh, opposing patriarchy. She was uh, smashing patriarchy. Uh, she was smashing a lot of things, uh, but when it came to criticism against her for the Madam Chief Minister poster, uh, she uh, cried foul um, and she was not ready to take the criticism and there were many casteist remarks that were also made uh, where she claimed uh, that, oh, you people do not understand how the film industry works. So by you people, it is always, I think, this patronizing attitude of dissent, right? That only we understand what real dissent is, that kind of entitlement that we will define what dissent is. And when you dissent, your dissent is either identity politics or your dissent is uh, reactionary or your dissent is sexist or your dissent uh, is, uh, you know, you know all, all these kind of labels, right? Uh, so, so who defines dissent? Who is the gatekeeper of dissent? And how convenient this dissent is, right? You pick up battles. You will pick up those battles that conveniently place you in the position of a victim, right? But when you are the oppressor, that is not a battle that you want to pick up. And, and that really needs to be questioned. You know, this, this whole woke, uh, uh, you know, narrative that is happening and everyone now is talking about privilege, but not questioning their own privilege. You know, that talk needs to happen. Those discussions need to happen. So, um, yeah, I would, I would, yeah like to add to that what, what was yeah. uh thank you the distinguished panelist for the wonderful remark and the insight uh, on uh, the dissent by the savarnas uh, and uh, the ambedkar thoughts uh, reflected by professor jadomani and disha uh, advocate disha Vadikar reflecting her own uh, set of ideas now i have a, a very uh, a very peculiar set of question uh, addressed to um, disha ma'am uh, and as lawyers we see a lot of cases of uh, sedition going on in country lately uh, sedition charges uh, blatantly being imposed blanket they're used as blanket charges although almost all of them uh, all of the uh, charges uh, there's no there's no charge sheet file there's no uh, further uh, steps taken by the police just it's it's a way to oppress the dissent so uh, just a recent example that would uh, fit in would be the no deep core case or uh, the Shiv Kumar case, or say uh, when the Hathras uh, rape case on a Dalit women happened, then multiple uh, journalists were placed by sedition charges for just covering the ground realities. So it, it, it states how uh, the state is approaching to curb dissent and clean, his, clean its image uh, uh, and suit it for the Savarna uh, 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 ideologies. So as a, as a lawyer, how do you feel uh, like these cases come into the Supreme Court because you see, uh, uh, you, as you point, rightly point, pointed out, Disha uh, Ravi's case getting much more attention uh, than someone who is getting custodial tortured for years now. 
just because they are uh, from a marginalized community and even then their bail matters are not taken up even then their cases are not taken up so uh, i would like to know your reflections on it and of course professor jadomani can next add to that um yeah i think uh, let's just uh, have certain as lawyers also and future lawyers and law students let's just have one thing very clear about the criminal justice system you know uh, the criminal justice system uh, functions within the same society right so if if the society is caste ridden the criminal justice system is just going to be another tool and machinery to further uh, those those power relations right uh, so I, i i i would really like to start by saying that the criminal justice system is uh, though in the very normative sense uh, is meant to be uh, uphold the rule of law right uh, should go by the tenets of equality before law and equal protection of law it really isn't that in practice and like you rightly pointed out you know in um, uh, you know not in course case of shivkumar's case uh, uh, really who benefits from this criminal justice system and who is targeted in this criminal justice system and historically uh, if this criminal justice system is a remnant of the manu dandi sahita right because because that is something that was uh, in this land that has existed in this land the manu smriti the manu dandi sahita the manu's law right that has governed us and then you had the british colonizers who were racializing people the transgender the denotified tribals the tribal community right and had created legal tools in the form of acts and laws to criminalize racialize police these communities we see that our present criminal justice is literally an admixture of uh, the brahminical colonization and the british colonization together and all the actors in the criminal justice system are therefore caste actors right and, and they are furthering caste interests right they are retaining the existing system and uh, the 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 kind of torture that nodeep kaur is facing uh, you know the kind of torture that shiv kumar faced right is is nothing but a reflection of that right we do not know we we know that the best lawyers in this country represented uh, the sharavi right uh, but uh, we we really do not know who the lawyers of not for war we do not know who the lawyers in uh, shiv kumar's case were right uh, everyone wants to jump in uh, to sort of take up uh, uh, you know priya ramani's calls uh, and the sharavi's calls right and and we see that uh, the quality of lawyers that they get uh, even uh, you know pro bono lawyering happens in their cases Uh, to a great extent uh, you do not see that same cause being taken in the same manner so the access when you are you come from a marginalized identity from a marginalized community and you descend the risk that you face the vulnerability that you face is much higher right uh, the access that you have to the criminal justice system is much lower you will not have the right kind of legal representation at the right time you will not have people jump in you do not have people take in your cause internationally you will not have judges pressurized from the top right uh, to take up and give you justice to take up your cause and give you justice right uh, you will have uh, even when you are released on bail the kind of surety that would be expected from you will be much higher and would make no sense and would be absurd in desharavi's case we saw that for a 21 year old uh, you know uh, woman uh, the surety was of i think around 1 lakh But let me tell you another thing. Let me divulge and let me tell you what had happened in Suvarna Salve's case. Suvarna Salve, a Dalit, twenty-four-year-old, year-old protester, has been taking up uh, many causes, right from CA and RC uh, to the recent farmers' protests, and uh, uh, even in Bhima Koregao, she was protesting. And this was her uh, the first of its kind case against her. Uh, in in the first case uh, itself, uh, she was charged. Uh, as a habitual offender under section 110 of the crpc right and this is the first case let me tell you that um and uh, the the surety that was expected from her a dalit 24 year old girl who lives in the slums of mumbai the surety that was demanded was 50 lakh right uh, this kind of surety means that a dalit bahujan person would always languish in jail right and that's that's what you see in the ncrb data you see that most of uh peop- most of those who languish in jails and who are under trials um are coming from dalit bahujan adivasi communities right so your access is is reduced when you come from so this is the privilege that you do not enjoy that the savarna dissenter would enjoy your access is re- less you are more at risk 
right? Uh, you are at risk from the state, from the police machinery, as also you are at risk from uh, the society at large. For example, you saw the recent RTI, Dalit RTI activist who was murdered, right? So your risk is not just the state, the Brahmin uh, uh, state, but it is, it is also the Brahmin Badia population, right? Uh, so, so I think, uh, you know, so the risk is more. Uh, your resources for remedy are less, right? When you come from a marginalized, you are a, you are a dissenter and you come from a marginalized community. So all in all, uh, really uh, the, the dissent, and when we're talking about the caste privilege of dissent, I think uh, upper caste savannas uh, enjoy a lot uh, of impunity in that sense, uh, uh, I, I feel, when it comes to dissent, which the Bahujans do not enjoy. And the criminal justice system have no uh, comms in saying this, that it is not meant for the marginalized, it is meant to further uh, the interests of the already uh, powerful uh, people in the society. So, I mean, that's the unfortunate part of it. I have nothing to add, just except one point. Uh, just I, you know, speak in my own way. Uh, so when we try to understand the idea called criminalization, I am really working on a paper and uh, you know troubling many of my friends who are in the discipline of law to understand this what this I is speaking. Now I can make sense of it, but I don't have any 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 evidence to actually go through. Uh, so I was I am I am trying to understand understand something called criminalization in India. Take example of caste as a criminal activity. So uh, the person who actually against caste is a criminal to a person who is casteist, who is a Hindu, who is a Brahminical person, right? And see the case, the person who are uh, the, the same person also, you know, uh, attacked by the police, arrested by the police, whatever region are there, there are several regions for this and this Koregao example and there are many examples taking place now, incident happy, happening. So it is because uh, these people are also, you know, against caste. So the state also, you know, in a way, uh, you know, uh, you know, criminalizing Dalit, criminalizing Adivasis and other anti-caste offholders. And at the same time, these, these people are also, you know, termed as, you know, uh, you know, uh, many other ways in the society itself. So uh, to understand this criminalization through the state and police would be a limitation to uh, uh, understand this, but one need to also go to the society and look at that, how the anti-caste itself is a criminal act according to the caste. So that's it. Thank you so much, Professor. Um, so we'll have one last audience uh, oh, question from the audience since we're almost running out of time. Um, so we got one question. Um, it, okay, so is liberal sophist sophistication casteist and how does it lead to gatekeeping? And also um, there was a question about caste appropriation in Bollywood and how um, this affects the discourse in caste. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I, I just spoke about uh, the recent Cha Cha Da case, right? Uh, and uh, we saw how it played out. Uh, what was the first question? Is 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 liberal sophistication casteist? Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I think I would like to ask that question to a Savarna person. Uh, my question to them, but um, of course it is. Uh, I, I think it leads to a lot of gatekeeping, like I said, you know, of what is valid dissent. Uh, is defined by them, um, and uh, uh, they they are definitely the gatekeepers of what dissent is. And what is most unfortunate to me is this: that uh, we are we the criminal justice system, uh, the Bahujans are overrepresented in the criminal justice system. They are hyper visibilized uh, when it comes to criminalizing them, right? Um, but when it comes to their voices. Uh, uh, their narratives, their discourses, you see how they are erased 
completely erased uh, from the mainstream discourse. And I think it was very evident from some of the cases that I talked to you about. I would really I'd like to ask you if you even heard of the Suvarna Salve case, or you heard of the Kumisikaka case, or you heard about what happened, uh, you know, the surveillance operation that happened post Bhima Koregao that I talked about, you know. This never even features in your mainstream uh, discourse anywhere. Right. I would really like to ask if you had heard that there were countrywide protests uh, after the Subhash Mahajan judgment, right? Uh, and uh, and Dalits were out on the streets, and nobody, no media house, nobody tried to cover it, uncover it, talk about it, right? Uh, so of course they are the gate gatekeepers. They de they decide who is a dissenter, who is not. They decide what is valid dissent, what isn't. Uh, they decide what is a valid reaction. Also, we saw that. Uh, uh, in this one case where uh, the N NCRT uh, cartoon case, you know, where uh, Ambedkar's cartoon caricature was made and there were Dalit groups that were opposing it because they obviously thought that it was uh, humiliating in, uh, at many levels, right? Uh, and all of that uh, in the mainstream discourse by the Savarnas got defined as reactionary, that was seen as hero worship, uh, that was seen as all of these names, right? So erasing voices has happened in this land forever and it still continues to happen erasing bahujan voices right the marginalized in this country are the bahujans they are the majority so we are a majority of marginalized people but you do not see our discourses our voices our point of views uh you know in the mainstream discourse right and that is the most unfortunate thing so um, I, I think that, uh, of course, the, the answer to that question, it's a rhetorical question, it is, it is a clear yes. So, yeah. Professor no, I'm not adding anything to this. She has already answered it. And I endorse this answer. Uh, sure, Professor. Sure. Uh, so thank you for taking out uh, time on a Sunday morning and talking about such a pertinent issue. Uh, thank you, Professor Jadumani and uh, uh, Disha ma'am for taking out time and addressing questions that were so pertinent. And uh, thank you everyone in the Human Rights Society uh, who made this possible and my co-moderator uh, for a wonderful talk. Uh, and we hope that we can uh, invite you further in such talks and uh, uh, have your insightful uh, opinions and thoughts uh, about the same. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am and uh, sir. So I really um, learned a lot from this talk, especially when you were speaking about, you know, the lack of democratization in um, knowledge of production amongst uh, upper class, uh, upper caste, upper class scholars. And uh, this is really in insightful. I thank you so much for taking the time out to speak to us. And we're really um, glad to have had this talk. Thank you. Uh, professors uh, and uh, Disha ma'am, you can leave now. We are uh, concluding the uh, conference. And if you have anything to add, you can go ahead or uh, we'll conclude after this. No, no, thanks, if there are any questions from the audience, uh, uh, we can take. Otherwise, it no, is I think, absolutely fine. I think I think we have we are done with the questions, okay. Professor. Okay. okay. Uh, so thank you so much again, and. Uh, oh, thanks, uh, thanks, thanks, thanks we'll, for inviting us. We'll expect you in some other great conference like this. Uh, thank, you. Uh, thank you. Thank you for taking out time. Some universalistic uh, topic and not just caste. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure, ma'am. Sure, ma'am. <laughs> No, why not? Uh, no, just just uh, just a point as besides, you know, saying we're not universalistic. So we're not anti-caste is an universal normative. Let's you know take this further. Yeah, we're not anti-caste, you know, as a principle of uh, you know universal normative. So then those who call themselves as upper caste and not not casteist would actually learn from this. <laughs> So, but I also enjoyed this, uh, this conversation, this, uh, this small, you know, uh, whatever number of people are here, but it's, uh, you are doing good. I hope uh, you will continue this and uh, thank you for inviting us. Thank you for inviting me. And yeah. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, bye. 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 Bye, Professor. Take care. Bye.